Hi everyone, so here I want to continue on the discussion about the valence bond model for bonding uh, for diatomic molecules. So in the first video we talked about this, uh, so, you know, this model of bonding and it's fairly straightforward, right? Hopefully everybody kind of see that, that um, you just need to have a valence electron in a valence orbital. It has to have a sing you know, single electron and then the two electrons then pair up forming that bond. and uh, you know, in theory, we can actually calculate the strength of this bond and so on if we know the wave functions and we can make those wave function type calculations. Of course, again, in this class, I want to emphasize that we can't really do that because the math level required is a little high, a little more advanced than what we have right now. But that's really what you can do with, with this particular model of bonding. Now, uh, what I want to mention then is, um, you know, I talk a little bit about this whole idea how the bond is formed. Uh, so then what I want to mention right now is that based on the way these uh, orbitals overlap with each other, there's actually two different types of bonds that you can form um, in the valence bond model, okay? And they are called sigma bond, which has the Greek letter sigma here, and then pi bond, Greek letter pi right here. And the difference between the two is, uh, the importance to, to note about the difference between the two is to know how the um, overlap uh, is with respect to something called the bond axis or the internuclear axis. So the internuclear axis or the bond axis is actually a fairly simple concept. It's basically the line that connects one nucleus with the other nucleus. So if I draw a line from this nucleus all across to the other one, that's what I refer to as the uh, what we refer to as the bond axis or internuclear axis. You can do the same here with this two hydrogen if I were to draw the nucleus is right located in the middle of this, if I were to draw a line across those two nuclei, then that would be referred to as the bond axis. So the difference between the two types of bonds is that with a sigma bond, the overlap is uh, the overlap area of the orbitals is cylind cylindrically symmetric around the internuclear axis. Okay, in other words, uh, and we'll do an example of this in a second. And then pi bond, on the other hand, the overlap is uh, not cylindrically symmetric around the bond axis, but it actually is, um, uh, you know, it's symmetric around the axis that is um, uh, perpendicular to that bond axis, okay? Okay, so let me show you examples of uh, what sigma bonds look like. Okay, so again, a sigma bond is basically a, a bond where when it's formed, when the overlap is formed, that overlap is uh, symmetric around the bond axis. So, for example, a 1s, 1s overlap, an s, s overlap, whether it's 1s, 1s, 2s, 2s, 3s, 3s, etc., always forms a sigma bond because if you look here, the s orbitals look like this, right? It's spherical. Uh, and if you draw a bond axis between the two nuclei, you notice that that area overlap would be symmetric around that bond axis, right? In other words, the top part of the overlap is exactly identical to the bottom part of the overlap. If I were to rotate that, uh, I will get exactly the same thing from top to bottom. Okay, that's what we mean by cylindrically symmetric. Um, an S, uh, P or, uh, overlap also forms a sigma bond because if you notice, here's the, here's the SP bond. So, uh, and you notice that that area of overlap again is going to be symmetric around that bond axis. Uh, in other words, the top and the bottom part will exactly, um, match with, with each other if you rotate if you rotate the electron density. Uh, a PZ, PZ overlap in this particular case, in other words, uh, uh, basically a, um, uh, an overlap where the one part of the P orbital is, is going into the, the overlapping with the other part of the P orbital like this way will also give us a, uh, a sigma bond. So for example, in this case, you're going to get here the um, the area of the overlap, which is this darker part right here, and if you rotate it from top to bottom, you're going to get uh, exactly the same thing, okay? Now, one thing I want to emphasize here, maybe which is not shown in this particular plot right here, remember that the p orbital actually has two phases, right? One is negative, the other one is positive. So you can imagine here's negative, positive, negative, positive. When I add the two of them together, you get negative, and then the two positives are in the middle, and then you have a negative. So in other words, when you rotate top to bottom here, you get exactly the same thing because they're both positives in this case, okay? But just, just to kind of emphasize that, um, you get the same electron density when you rotate around the bond axis for this 2P2, you know, for this PZ, PZ overlap. Uh, 
so that's sigma bond, right? It's a cylindrically symmetric around the the bond axis. And also the other thing to note here is that you can always rotate around a sigma bond. In other words, let's say I hold this particular s orbital fix and I start rotating this other atom that has this orbital, right? I can rotate this H around that bond and that is a free rotation. Uh, in other words, that rotation is allowed because I'm not breaking the bond when I'm rotating, right? I can keep rotating this, uh, you know, I rotate this around that uh, internuclear axis and I'm not breaking that bond. Uh, same thing with this one, I can rotate this around again around this axis right here, this bond axis. If I rotate this p orbital and keeping that one s fixed, I'm not breaking that bond, okay? So the sigma bond allows free rotation or, uh, along that bond axis, okay? Now let's talk about pi bond. A pi bond looks like this, okay? Uh, and it's basically, if you notice, it's the type of overlap that happens with uh, the other two p orbitals, right? So remember earlier we used pz to illustrate the sigma bond formed by p orbitals. The other two type of p orbitals, which is the px and py orbitals, they're going to overlap this way, which is kind of a side-to-side -side overlap. So this is, uh, you can imagine this to be a head-to-head -head or an end-to-end -end overlap. This one would then be considered a side-to-side -side overlap because these two are coming together and they're forming this combined electron density above the plane and below the plane of the bond axis. Remember, this is the bond axis here, this line right here. So you have an electron density above the bond axis and below the bond axis, okay? So that looks different than what we saw here because here we have this thing in the middle um, and then that thing could then rotate around the bond axis and is cylindrically symmetric. This one, on the other hand, is not. Why isn't, why isn't it cylindrically symmetric? Because remember, as I mentioned just now, the p orbital has two phases. So let's imagine this to be the plus phase, and this is the negative phase, and this is the plus, and this is the negative. So in other words, the top part here, you have an electron density that has a positive phase, and the bottom you have an electron density that has a negative phase. Even though in this particular picture they don't differentiate it and might look identical to you, but really the top part is positive and the bottom part is negative. So when you rotate around the bond axis, you don't get a uh, you don't get a symmetric picture at the bottom. You don't get the same picture at the bottom because the top orbital has a different phase than the bottom orbital. Okay, so this is what we refer to as a pi bond. Now. As a result, because you can't just rotate, you know, if I just rotate around it, basically that bond no longer forms, right? If I, if I keep this one fixed and I start rotating this one around the bond axis, I'm not going to get the same bond anymore because remember that it has to be positive, positive, and negative, negative. If I start rotating, then the positive comes down and the negative goes up, then I no longer have that pi bond, which means that pi bond doesn't allow free rotation, okay? So here's comment number four here. There's no free rotation around a pi bond. In other words, if you have a pi bond, you can't rotate around that bond, but you can rotate around the sigma bond, okay, as shown earlier, as discussed earlier. So how do you determine whether something is a pi bond or a, or a sigma bond without having to actually draw all of these structures, right? Because if you draw them, then you can tell, yeah, this one is a, is a sigma bond because when I rotate around the you know, bond axis, the top and the bottom part are symmetric, whereas this one, the top and the bottom part are not symmetric because, again, they have different phases. Well, the easy way to tell is you draw a Lewis structure. When you draw a Lewis structure, the first bond is always uh, a sigma bond, and any additional bond on top of that first bond between the two atoms would be considered pi bonds, okay? So, in other words, the simplest thing to remember then would be to say if there's only a single bond between two atoms, then that's a sigma bond. If there's a double bond, one of the bonds is a sigma bond, the other bond is a pi bond. If there's a triple bond, one of the bonds is a sigma bond, the other two bonds are pi bonds, okay? So that's the easiest way to think about this right now, if you just want to memorize uh, stuff, okay? So let's show an example of where a molecule where both sigma and pi bonds are present, and this molecule will be the nitrogen gas, N2, okay? So let me just show you the electron configuration first because that's how we're going to start with this. So the nitrogen atom has this following configuration, 1s2, 2s2, and 2p3. But the 2p3, remember, because of Hunt's rule, has to be distributed in, 
these individual p orbitals, right? They can't be clumped together. Okay, so 2p, uh, one of the electrons will be in this 2px, 2py, and 2pz orbital. Okay, now the interesting thing here, as you notice, of course, is that uh, when the N2 molecule forms, it's going to form the bonds by using these three um, orbitals, I mean, these three single electrons right here, because you remember that that's how valence bond theory proposes how bonds are formed. You have uh, each atom bringing a single electron, and those single electrons pair up. So if I have a nitrogen that has three single electrons, I have another nitrogen that has three single electrons as well, then those two nitrogens can come together, and each of the single electron can pair up with the other single electron, and then they form three pairs, which means there's three bonds, right? I want to add this picture now of the uh, uh, Lewis structure, and that what, what I just said is that the bond would have three, uh, or the nitrogen molecule will have three bonds, and that's exactly what we observe, right? When we draw the Lewis structure of this, uh, we have three bonds, uh, in between the two nitrogen, of course, this is just your lone pair here that uh, is orig that that was the two s electrons that was originally still uh, belonging to that nitrogen atom. But then you share these three pairs here, so each nitrogen atom has an octet. Um, but the question now is, how do you represent the uh, bonding in a valence bond model? Well, remember that each of this p orbital is going to overlap with this I with the same p orbital from the other nitrogen. So the px would overlap with the px, the py would overlap with the py, and then the pz would overlap with the pz as well. Based on our discussion earlier, remember that the pz pz overlap would look like this. So that's the one that is right here, right in the middle. So here's your pz, okay? So here's one pz, this one right here, from one nitrogen atom. Here's the other pz from the other nitrogen atom, and they overlap, and they form this bond right here which is a sigma bond okay and then the other two p orbitals which is your px this is one px right here and then the other px which is right here they're going to form an overlap and this is usually because the drawing because this type of drawing is really hard to do uh, by hand right so usually the way the bonds the overlap is indicated by just drawing a bunch of dashed lines across the two uh, orbitals that have this side to side overlap so that uh, this overlap right here, which is between the two, uh, the px-px orbitals, that's going to form one pi bond, okay? And then the other pi bond is the overlap between the py, which is the shade at p orbitals right here. So that's py, one py right here, and another py right here. And the py-py overlap, you can also draw that by a dashed line. It's not written in here, but that would be also another py-py overlap. And that will be another pi bond. So you got a second pi bond here. So overall, you have one sigma bond and two pi bond. But again, you can tell that just from looking at the Lewis structure because, like I said earlier, if you have a triple bond, one of the bonds would be a sigma bond, and the other two bonds would be a pi uh, would be pi bonds. Okay. So one. Of, so what we're going to move on to in the next topic is to talk about the fact that sometimes it's not so simple. Sometimes you're trying to come up with, um, you know, bonds by considering the single electrons, but it turns out that you don't get the, the exact, the, you know, the same number of bonds as you would, as you observe uh, in experiments. So then how do we solve that problem with the valence bond model? We're going to use something called the hybrid orbitals, but that's the topic that we'll discuss in the next set of videos.